Hi! Welcome to another video by Fortune Buchholz of NotFortuneSchool.com. I'm continuing in my series of how to read with Ciro Marchetti's new fin de siècle, Kipper Deck. So uh, I've made several videos about the history and origins of the deck. I made a video about the quote-unquote extra cards and how they uh, are represented uh, in the history of similar German decks and also English decks and earlier games such as Harlequin Takes All. And I, I highly recommend that you go back and look at that video and the videos for the line of five as well as the square of nine. All of these will help you um, build towards uh, this video, which is going to be, I'm afraid, rather long because it's going to cover the entire Grand Tableau. Now the Grand Tableau can have many steps and many applications. What I'm going to show is my general procedure for reading uh, a Grand Tableau. I do it uh, basically in nine steps, right? So uh, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to go to voiceover mode with static pictures just as I have in my other two reading videos. I'm going to start with two quick slides where I'm just going to show you you know very shortly what the nine steps are and I'm not going to spend a lot of time explaining them and then I'm going to talk about a situation uh, that happened recently where a sitter came to me uh, struggling uh, to formulate a question saying they just needed a general reading uh, but when you actually talk to people about you know what it means to have a general reading they often uh, will eventually come to the realization that what they what their real problem is or what their deeper struggle is is that they don't know how to prioritize their life and they're not quite sure really how they feel about what's going on in their own life they may not understand what their own uh, concerns are and they may not uh, understand what hands-on actions are available to them to address those concerns once they've been identified or to move forward generally in their life and this removes uh, a lot of confusion and also sets a fertile ground for them to help think about their priorities what they're really feeling what they're really thinking and what actions they really can do uh, to be successful and to fulfill their own agenda once they have found a method to, you know, sort of list their agenda for themselves, connect themselves to themselves, and talk to themselves about what they really need to know. So this is the situation that we're going to cover in the uh, upcoming uh, voiceover portion. I hope you find it useful. Uh, again, I really want to thank you for your time. I want to thank everyone in the international card community for their incredible support. I'm so grateful for that. I'm glad this deck and the uh, companion document, which I co-authored with my two wonderful co-authors, has uh, been so well received and has uh, sparked such an interest in reviving the Kipper. So thanks so much, and I'll see you again on the other side in the voiceover portion. Yeah, have a great day. Hi, here we are back on the other side. You can see we're in the static video portion of the Grand Tableau. And as promised, I have put up uh, two pictures, sort of mini slides, that just sort of briefly describe my general nine step approach to uh, your average Grand Tableau. Of course, there are many ways of reading the Grand Tableau. There are many techniques that you can use, but these are just the nine sort of basic uh, overview uh, steps that I always like to teach people and that I will demonstrate here in this video with the Kipper. Of course, more advanced techniques we can talk about in a future video if that's of interest to you. And if it is, please don't hesitate to tell me uh, in comments on social media. So uh, thanks for that. I just wanted uh, everybody to sort of take a look at these nine steps, how we start with the first three cards, how we then go ahead in step two and pair the corners diagonally to create a simple sentence that sort of gives us the frame of the picture. After all, grand tableau means the big picture, so it helps us to establish the frame. Then we look at the significator cards, right? Usually this is going to be the gentleman, or the lady, right? We're going to look at their um, present situation by looking at the column in which they lie. Remember the cards above them are that which is on their mind or the situation in which they are embedded. Um, cards below them are things that they, uh, you know, can be repressing 
or things that they have control over. Again, that all depends on the context of the question. And then we look directionally for the for the sort of the past, which I like to think more of as sort of understanding the cause, and the future is more as things could possibly play out based on the situation as they are now. But of course, we always have free will, right? We always have the ability to take some kind of concrete action to amend our circumstances, even if it's only to change our own attitude. Then for more details, I like to read the square of nine, around the significator card, the card that's currently in focus. And you can uh, go back and see how to read the square of nine in my square of nine video. Uh, then I look for other significator cards that may be relevant based on the topic of the question or what comes out in the discussion of the previous steps. Right? And then I may want to see how the two significator cards, uh, the man or the, the gentleman or the lady, and this other significator based on the topic or issue or the, the discussion relate to each other, and we may discuss that relationship. Then otherwise, I would look for the, you know, what people can do, what's the hands-on thing people can do to address a certain concern, right? Because we always want to help our clients and help our sitters have concrete actions that they can carry forward to create their own future. And then if, if they have concerns or issues or problems and they struggle to articulate them to themselves or they can't quite understand what's bothering them, I will look to the concerns card uh, and, uh, you know, read the square of nine around that to see what could possibly, you know, be on their mind, what could be unspoken, what could be concerning them, and then, um, you know, develop that in a discussion with the sitter. So that's kind of my overview of the Grand Tableau. Um, if, if you have time and if it's pertinent, I mean, it may not be pertinent, you may have addressed everyone's issues, you can also look at the houses of the significators and chain the houses, and that's a technique that we can talk about uh, if you're not familiar with that technique of going from house to house as we follow the cards, um, to kind of look at, you know, more background or more information. Often uh, this chaining of the houses is just more confirmation of what you've already read. So it's not always necessary, and I, I don't always do it. But it is also something that you can do kind of in summation, and that's helpful to a lot of clients. Uh, so with that said, you know, I have kind of both of those slides, you know, one through nine there. And you can take out your deck and, you know, get out your notebook and get out your, your pencil or pen, stop the video and kind of take little notes on these if you would like to kind of follow this mechanic as you lay out the cards and, you know, follow along as we move right into looking at the grand tableau, which I'm going to drop in an image of uh, in just a moment. So I hope that uh, works for you, and I hope that you don't have any questions about that because I'm not going to say any more about the game mechanic or uh, the ludics, as I sometimes say, uh, of the, the reading, and I'm just going to go ahead and talk, you know, in detail about the actual tableau. Hi everybody, here we are back again, and now you can actually see before you the entire grand tableau. And with the nine steps in mind, you're going to want to go ahead and either pause the video here to lay your cards out in the matching formation, or you can just go ahead and take notes while I just sort of walk through the nine steps that I illustrated for you before and uh, we'll kind of proceed to do this sort of general reading. So let's talk for a moment about the sitter and her question. So you know I always change these details in order to be ethical and so with that usual caveat about how I protect the confidentiality and ethics of our client, of my client, which is always very important, um, we go ahead and then go ahead and get started. So here's the background of the situation. So the sitter comes with this kind of, you know, I just have a general question. It's very difficult for her to formulate any specific question or theme for her. Uh, she uh, feels very stressed out and she's not really sure what's going on in her life. So when uh, I ask her about herself, 
you know, she informs me that she is unmarried, uh, has just recently bought her own condo, is working uh, alternating or rotating shifts uh, as a cardiac nurse, and uh, doesn't really particularly have a relationship at the moment. So um, this is sort of her background, and she wants to, she just feels kind of a little bit at loss, kind of overwhelmed, uh, a little bit at sea. So we're just kind of going to walk through and help her formulate some ideas about what could really be important to her in her life right now, and what uh, priorities she could possibly set for herself so she feels uh, less at sea and less anxious. So let's just go ahead and kind of talk about that. Of course, the first thing that I like to do, according with step one, is to read the first three cards in the tableau. If you look at the tableau, you can see that we have Kipper 5, Kipper 3, and Kipper 19. Uh, or as uh, Chero has in his deck, Mature Man, uh, marriage and coffin. So I immediately asked her uh, what kind of uh, partnership uh, or business relationship uh, came to an end very recently. Um, and of course, she, she talked about uh, that this was a, a time for her when she was changing her shifts in the normal rotation. I guess like a lot of nurses, uh, she worked these 12 hour shifts and where she alternated between day and night and she would do two weeks of day and then two weeks at night with kind of a day or two off in between and she was just uh, changing this uh, rotation and they had had a meeting about uh, changing the rotation uh, and, and I guess their usual sort of nurses staff meeting. And she was uh, feeling uh, sad about changing this particular shift because she had really liked working with the group of people who had been doing uh, days with her uh, and she would not be working with the same group of people on the next two week rotation. So that was, you know, that was a a sort of a, a moment of sorrow for her that happened today. So uh, that's kind of the first three cards. So we can see that, you know, her work is very important to her. Obviously, as a nurse, she's a very caring person, very empathetic, very concerned about her environment and her social environment and the people around her. And she forms attachments to her colleagues uh, and feels very close to them all. So let's go ahead then and pair the corners diagonally. And here again, we have the mature man, and number one, the main male, the haupt person. Then the other corner here, we have false person, card eight, and military man or official person, or as I like to call him in Chiro's deck, the field marshal, card 22. So the symbols, remember, in the kipper are multivalent. And as we shift from step to step, you know, the cards may not necessarily be the same people. So for example, the mature man, which she identified in the first step of, you know, grouping the first three cards, she identified as working with a particular doctor from whom she had learned a lot. But now in this configuration, uh, when we pair the card, uh, card number five with card number one, we can see that actually it represents someone else. And so I ask her a lot, since we know that she uh, doesn't have a relationship in her life right now, I ask her if card number five could be her father or an elderly relative. And she does reply that, in fact, she has recently um, been very concerned with her father and her parents overall, and she spent a lot of time with them. They are obviously retired now, uh, and so, uh, you know, she helps them out a lot and they help her out a lot. So they're, you know, really the second most important thing to her at the moment, you know, after her job. And so that was a, a good clarification for herself and for me, you know, what is the priority? Are her parents more important than her job or is her job her most important thing? So she's already gotten her, you know, sense of prioritization more stabilized just by looking at the cards and talking out loud to herself about, you know, who these cards could be and what their relationships to her could feel like right now. So um, when we look at then, you know, what's wrong, that is, who is the false person and card 22, right? So we're talking about her father and how is her father enmeshed in some kind of official situation or, you know, some kind of problem or falsity around this. We can look at card 22, of course, not as someone in the military, but someone in any kind of uniform or, or someone who is sarcastic, 
brash, authoritative, someone who is in charge of a situation when you're not, right? Someone who gives the marching orders, as I like to say. So um, we, you know, we ask, you know, what, how that's affecting her father now, and she talks about an issue uh, that goes with her mother. So um, we'll, we'll go ahead and go to that, but her, her father definitely feels that uh, her, her mother has uh, gotten a speeding ticket that she didn't deserve. So literally, this is a policeman, and this is a wrong event or something wrong. And this is upsetting her father and is a, a, a family drama, pro probably fairly minor, but it feels important at the time, right? So you know how these how these things with your family can go, right? You can become enmeshed in, in these dramas, particularly, you know, when there's a sense of, of issue or injustice and you're the person who's really taking care of them, they, they can really become, you know, central to you and you can sort of get very wrapped around that axle, so to speak. So uh, let's go ahead then and look at the line of the present. So if you look at the line of the present, right, you can see that she herself is card number two, Hopperson, there she is in the last line uh, of the grand tableau. And if we look at the cards in the column above her, right, we can see what's on her mind or the situation she's enmeshed in. And here we see immediately at the top, card 33, concern, card 30, uh, magistrate, or Chiro calls it judication. Of course, this exactly takes us to the concept of traffic court, right? Six is the mature woman, the older female relative. This would be her mother in this case. And then 32, we can see the sense of despair. That is, her mother is really upset about having uh, gotten this traffic ticket and you know, her father feels it was very, it was, it was really unjust and it wasn't right. So you can actually see how all of these things kind of line up in terms of her relationship to her parents and how this is really, you know, on her mind and this is what's going on in her life today. All right. So that's kind of, you know, very interesting. It's just a very straightforward reading, you know, following the cards and it's not um, particularly kind of complex, though, of course, these situations are, you know, important to her. So let's go ahead and um, talk for a moment about the cards around her. Uh, we can see that uh, if we look at the square of nine, since she's in the bottom row, we don't have a complete square of nine here, right? So um, we can... Uh, you know, leave it as it is and read the cards as they lie, or we have the choice of mirroring the cards by bringing that top row of cards, cards 21, cards 33, and card 11, right, down to the bottom beneath her so that she'll have a complete square of nine. And if you'd like to do that, of course, you know, that's something that you can do, this kind of mirroring, or you can, as I said, just read the cards as they lie. It, depends on what you feel like it is appropriate for the context of the situation and for the question. So um, let's go ahead and just go ahead and mirror the cards. I'm going to pull them down. And if you've laid out your cards, then I uh, encourage you to pause the video for a moment and follow suit. All right, so now we have her sort of surrounded by nine cards. We've moved the family room, concern, and sudden wealth, card 11, beneath the uh, lady card. So she has her full square of nine. So then if we read the corners of this, right, we immediately see that we have card 35 and card 11. We have pathway and sudden wealth. So that's a very interesting pairing. And then let's go ahead and talk about a journey and family room. So this immediately uh, makes me uh, ask her if she's considered uh, lately traveling somewhere uh, with her parents, um, and if she has perhaps uh, gotten um, a little extra money or gotten uh, something on the side that uh, she was thinking of using uh, as a gift to her parents or to help her parents out. And she talked about the fact that she actually had literally considered going um, to uh, a local casino, uh, there is one here in the area, with her parents uh, just as a night out, just to go to the kind of like nightclub and events there, just to uh, you know play the slot machines, and that they would make that trip 
together along that path, and that was something that they would like to do and that they had done as a family activity in the past. So I just thought that was, you know, very interesting and and kind of charming. Um, and and so, you know, then I wanted to look for more detail at the um, at the cards around her in the diamond. Again, we see the card 32, which is, you know, despair, concern, the anxiety that that we ha have already expressed about the situation with her mother's parking ticket. Um, and then we also have unexpected income. So this, to me, uh, kind of suggests that, you know, they will not have to pay the fine. Maybe the ticket would be dismissed. Uh, and they are worried about, you know, of course, as retired people coming up with any extra money, I guess these kinds of speeding fines can be quite large, uh, sometimes two or even $300. So, you know, that's obviously something that they're worried about is, you know, where are you going to find this money, right? And, you know, will they have to pay it? So... Uh, then we can see uh, when we pair concern with the card following it in the diamond, which is card 37, Chiro's poverty, we can see that, in fact, the concern is about the loss of the money. And when we pair 37 with 32, we can see that there's a lot of anxiety about, you know, paying this traffic ticket. So, um, you know, that's just sort of what's going on and what is her family situation, which, of, co of course, her family is very important to her. And it is really, as she said, what, you know, has been uh, sort of happening in her environment today overall. So, um, you know, that's kind of that situation right there. So I often like to then go ahead and take a moment and return the cards to their original position. So that's, you know, what I would go ahead and do. And if you'd like, you can stop the video and go ahead and do the same. Notice that she herself is in the house 30, 37. She herself is in the house of uh, a loss of money. So it seems to me that if they were to have to pay the ticket, then she would be the person who would actually give her parents the money or lend her parents uh, the money to do so. But uh, clearly the this fate of whether you would lose the money and have to, to pay the fine or not is of concern to, you know, all of them. Um, but, you know, that's just sort of like where we lie uh, with that. So um, since we have gone ahead and talked about the father, let's go ahead and talk about the significator of the other party, that is the mother, right, which again would be card number six, which lies in the third row uh, right above the uh, main female card. So we're going to look at card number six, the mature female. So when we... Um, uh, look at her, we can see that she actually has a very nice uh, square of nine. You can see she has on her square of nine great fortune, which is certainly uh, one of the most auspicious and enabling cards in the deck, and then card 10, a journey. So she'll, you know, obviously could, should, could, should consider actually making a fortunate or propitious journey uh, that she is thinking about even though and that's card 16, even though card 35, pathway, it may be difficult. And of course, the, the you know, situation that uh, is being discussed here, the, the client or sitter feels, is going to traffic court to actually combat the ticket. So this is what, you know, she uh, feels like her mother ought to do, and this seems like it would be of great benefit to the mother. So if we look at the cards around the mother, we can see again, uh, adjudication or the magistrate, card 30. Then we, we look at the other card in the other leg of the diamond there, uh, card 23, which is the courthouse. This is literally going to the courthouse and talking to the judge uh, and her you know concern and anxiety around that, which then nine will change. So this suggests that she actually, if she goes to the trouble of fighting the ticket and going down to court, she actually could possibly win it. You know, this despair would change, and the judge would also change the ticket. So that you know that seems like a uh, very positive, and it does seem like it would be uh, worth her mother's time, even though it's difficult for her and anxiety producing to go ahead and fight the ticket. And she might want to help her mother and encourage 
uh, her mother to do that. So if we look at the chains between these two cards, right, between card number two, which represents the sitter, and card number six, which represents the mother, we see they're connected in a chain by card 32. That is, they both share this anxiety, right? The mother's trying to repress her anxiety and her feelings, right? Whereas the client definitely has her mother's feeling and her own anxiety very much on her mind. So that's sort of how we kind of look at that chain there. And so that's, a, I think, a very interesting suggestion. Now, if we want to go ahead and talk about then the next step, which would be step six, step seven, excuse me, looking to the occupation card to see what other things she could do to help her parents, right, or to help her job, since these are the two issues that we have already, you know, identified and are talking about as important to her at this time, right, uh, we can see that if we look at uh, the occupation card, things that she can do, we can look again around the square of nine around that. So we're just going to repeat the square of nine process, right? So we're going to uh, look to her father's expectation, right? Um, and so her, we then look also about the end of a short-term situation, right? Um, or, you know, a, a negative health event. So this means that I want to ask her about her father's health in general, and it's true that her father is elderly, he is retired, he has many of the problems that, you know, um, uh, elderly people do. Naturally, since she is a nurse, right, they're always of prime concern to her, and she does very much, you know, care about um, her father's uh, health, and he does have a minor uh, medical issue with his blood pressure at the moment, but she believes that he will soon um, resolve that. So, uh, you know, she wants to overall improve her relationship with her father, to in, to find more time to spend with them and enjoy them. This is very difficult for her, although they have the time now that they're retired. She, of course, works these rotating shifts. She works days. She works nights. It's very difficult for her to, you know, always make plans as she would like to, you know, to have enough time to take care of herself and her own life, uh, of which there actually doesn't seem to be very much at the moment, does there, uh, in order to focus on, you know, her parents. So we talk uh, a lot about what she could do to, you know, help her father become uh, more uh, self-aware of taking care of his health so that it's less uh, emotional burden for her, right? And then we go ahead and we look around... Um, sort of uh, the situation, again, about what more she could do. So it turns out that her father has a, a very uh, particular set of hobbies. Her mother likes to garden, and her father is kind of a handyman. So uh, we can see that this is uh, that their partnership, right, literally card number three, card 38, is based on, you know, the hands-on things, really. If we look at toilet and labor, stuff you've got to do, you know, kind of hands-on, right, that are kind of difficult and require a lot of, you know, effort, right? Uh, we can see that in terms of her father, who literally, like, tinkers with machines and stuff, right, as we see there kind of in the card. And then also her mother, who also literally, you know, does a lot of, like, you know, digging and, and hard work with that. So there's a lot of, you know, they're, they're hardworking people. They've always been hardworking people. They're sort of working class people, and these are, are, are their hobbies, right? Um, they actually gain a lot of emotional benefit from them, and, uh, you know, when you're retired, it's very important to have hobbies, to develop hobbies, to devote time to them, right? That's where you get a lot of emotional reward, which is very important and prevents uh, a sense of depression or a sense of loss when one is retired. So these are very rich, card 13, wealthy man. These are very rich activities for her parents, which she should encourage uh, them in and also help them pursue. And then uh, we have card number seven, a message, right? And so that goes ahead and, and leads me to ask if she, you know, how she talks to her parents, how does she feel that, that her communication with them is? And and she does uh, feel like she does talk to them almost every day um, and that she uh, really benefits 
uh, from that kind of support because they're very supportive of her and they're also very dependent on you know hearing from her and uh, so she has a very good relationship with her parents and she does communicate with them often so she uh, she felt like that this square of nine really sort of described the situation between herself and her parents very accurately and gave her some ideas on how she could continue to support her parents talk to her father about his you know, health issues and also spend, you know, a lot more time being involved in their hobbies with them or hearing more about, you know, their hobbies. Um, as I said, because her relationship with her parents was very important to her. So uh, we've talked uh, about some of, you know, her main areas. Um, let's go ahead and then and talk about what, uh, you know, what areas are really troubling her. So if we look at, at card 33, the concern card, which is the card that I would use as the significator for this, right, then um, we see that the concern card does not, again, have a complete square of nine. We would move the cards from the bottom row back to the top of these. So let's go ahead and do that. And if you like, again, you can pause the video while we go ahead and create that mirror by moving cards 27 cards to card two and card 37 to the top of card 33 concern so that we have a complete square of nine. And when we do that, then we can go ahead and see that we have card 27, uh, which we would pair using the diagonal corner mechanic with card 16, thoughts, right? Again, they're, they're thinking about the unexpected income or the unexpected... Um, sort of, you know, expense here, right? The um, household expense of having to pay this fine. And then we can see card 37, poverty, card 26. So from a loss of money, they go to good fortune, right? Or great fortune. So again, this suggests that they, they will not, uh, or they may not have to pay the money if they go through the effort of actually fighting the ticket. Because again, remember, the kipper is always about what you can do, what you might do, what you should do to create a better outcome for yourself, right? So uh, then we go ahead and let's look at the diamond around concern. Here we see herself, card number two at the top of the diamond, goes to 21, the, fam her, the family room, which is literally those people who are close to you, right? What is very close to you. Uh, what's what's you know important to your mind near to you and we have again 30 the situation with the magistrate the situation of the parking ticket and again then we go on to card 11 sudden wealth again suggesting that she will not have to come up with the money to pay the parking ticket nor will her parents so um, you know th that helps us see that her concerns may not it may not be as grim as she fears and uh, this anxiety that she has about her parent situation, you know, it could be uh, alleviated, right? And she doesn't have to, uh, to, you know, freak out about it. She can just take it one day at a time, go ahead and focus on fighting the ticket to their best of their ability and hopefully getting a good outcome. Uh, so, you know, that is kind of that situation in terms of the concern. Um, now, as I said, if we wanted to, we could go ahead and we could chain the houses together uh, but that's not, I think, something that um, I want to go to in this uh, particular video at this time. I just wanted to quickly take everyone through the uh, square, uh, the squares of nine and the procedures for reading the grand tableau so that you could kind of see how you would do it and how you could very simply go through to create these chain, these chains, these situations, and to help uh, sort of sitters talk about what's on their mind. So once we've talked about, you know, these particular issues and we sort of ranked the priorities, you know, um, trying to get a more stable job situation if possible so she has more time for herself and for her parents, right? Uh, helping her parents with their hobbies, helping their parents with this immediate problem of the traffic ticket. This also then turns to other concerns such as, you know, how, how can her... Uh, how can she and her parents sort of set aside more funds so that they have buffers for little incidents like these, uh, that on their fixed income they don't have to be so concerned about small sums of money like $200 or $300? Is there a way that they could all work together or make new plans or new habits that would allow them to stockpile even a little extra money so that they don't have to worry, as I said, about these you know small ups and downs that happen to everybody 
uh, in life. But, you know, obviously, to if we have the $200, it's not a huge deal, right? But if when you don't have a t the $200, that really, like, looms very large to you, this sense of loss, the sense of poverty. Again, we go back to the woman in House 37 of not having enough. So uh, these are just some things that, you know, we talked about how she could do them if she would feel comfortable doing them, uh, how she might approach her parents and uh, about these kinds of things. So we, we sort of started to make a little list, as you, can, as you can hear. And then at the very end, I wanted to talk about uh, the fact that we just did not see in this grand tableau a lot of self-care, right? And that was um, very concerning to me. So this is where I wanted to take a look at the diagonals kind of around her card, particularly the forward diagonals, you know, the, the sort of forward in, 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 the, in the, you know, looking to the right direction here because she's facing to the right here. So if we look at this, these sort of two future cards, we see poverty, which is the concern with the loss of money, right? And then we see card 25, which is community. So, uh, you know, she was concerned with the loss of money, but then the last card is high honors, right, which is sitting in the house of community. So, you know, she will be able to alleviate this issue of helping her parents get together a little, you know, extra money so they can handle these problems. And she doesn't herself have to worry about the monetary loss, where we can see then in high honors sitting in the house of community that, you know, her work situation is not only very beneficial for her, but she's very highly regarded you know, in her job, in, in her community, and uh, that, you know, when she needs to ask for, you know, favors or changes, she can go ahead and get that as is necessary to support her parents, such as in the case of going down with them as they fight this traffic ticket. So, um, you know, I just thought that was kind of very interesting. Now, if we go ahead and look at her other forward or future diagonal, right, we, we're going to look at the cards two, card 10, journey, Continuing at the diagonal 12, um, this is the privileged lady, as Chiro calls it, or the rich young lady. I often call her the great beauty, as you know. And then we have card 17, the gift, right, which is a very powerful card and another very enabling card. So I wanted to ask her, um, you know, when she was taking a vacation and what she did on her vacations, what did she do for herself? Had she considered maybe perhaps taking some kind of spa vacation, right, since uh, the young maiden stands for everything that is, you know, beautiful and luxurious, right? Had she considered how she could splurge for herself and, you know, really pamper herself and spend more spend more time making, you know, room for her self-comfort and her self-care. So that was something that we ended up talking about quite a lot. And, and I asked her why that was number third, third, three, excuse me, why that was number three on her list, you know, so she has her job, her parents, and then she's last. And since she is kind of a helping and a caring person, I, it was very interesting to me that she did not always spend enough time taking care of herself, and she hadn't always made provisions for this kind of self-care. So we talked about you know, what she could do to take better care of herself, to give herself her own love and support. And as I said, we talked about whether she would be interested in something like some kind of spa vacation or, you know, regular massages or, you know, and she sort of talked about the kinds of things that she might like uh, to do to, to give a gift to herself in that respect. So uh, that was kind of the outcome. You can see how uh, we helped her alleviate her anxieties, set a list of sort of priorities, help her figure out what was important for her life, for her, her job, her parents, and herself, and also how she could focus more on self-care. So I hope you found all of that very interesting. If you have any uh, questions, please don't hesitate to contact me on the social media. I'm very grateful for your time. I'm sorry that this uh, video goes on a little longer than some of the others, but, you know, the Grand Tableau is an entirely... Uh, you know, huge information-packed layout, and you can actually easily spend often an hour and a half to two hours talking about a grand tableau, but I just wanted to carefully sort of walk you through the mechanics sort of of the kipper and um, of a grand tableau in general so that you could see how it works. Uh, in my next video, I do want to do another 
Lenormand mixed with Kipper Grand Tableau, now that you sort of have seen the mechanics for the Grand Tableau. And I, again, I hope to have that up for you in just three or four days. So thanks for your patience. Thanks for your time. I'm very grateful. And until we talk again, have a great day.